So can I answer any question before we move on on this one? All right, so we put this behind us and uh, we move on. Someone wanted to see a question of the exam. Uh, sorry, I wonder Yes, so let me put here the question. Which question is that? 15. All right, so <coughs> I think that to make this productive, you now know what is the answer, right? You should say, I don't like this answer. Or I think uh, this also is a correct answer. Or something, so I know what to pick because otherwise that. Uh, so I mean, uh, initially I had thought that the answer was that there was a What does it say, A? <laughs> a says, if you pick an element of the domain, eh, you send it uh, to exactly one element of the codomain. All right? So let me make a, a trivial example of this. A trivial example, I have a function that the, the domain eh, has a 0 and 1. Only these two elements. This is the domain. The codomain has only 0 elements, right? And so I send 0 to 0 and 1 to 0. All right? So here, each element of A has exactly one element of B that is mapped to, right? 0 is mapped exactly to 0, and 1 is mapped exactly to 0. This is not injected. Does it answer your question? All right. Very good. Since we are at this, should we look at some other problem? And I would like you to tell me why you ask me. Because uh, now you know the solution. So there is something that uh, is amiss, uh, and if I know, I fix it. Yes. If I change the wording of A, then how would you change the wording of A? So, so, when we talk about something unique, uh, it's unique inside uh, some sets or whatever, right? So here, it's unique among the who? I'm sorry? Well, this is a set, so any element that there is unique. You cannot have two copies of zero. So every element in B is unique in the sense that there is no other element in B that is equal to that. I am not sure I answered. Uh, uh, I'm just curious if it doesn't sound so familiar. Like, so we can see that it has that, that it points to this both points to zero. Is there a way to word it so that it can be A? A. So you want to change A to make it the correct answer. It's C. Change it into C. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> you want to change A without really changing A. So it becomes correct. You ask me a mirror. Sometimes I do them, but uh, I'm not sure I can make it here. Let me make sure that he is happy before we move on. All right. He's happy. Yes, I'll be able to go over any of these. 24. All right, so ask me why. Ask me why. So now you know the answer, right? Uh, yes. So ask me why you want to see the solution now that you know the answer. Because perhaps you don't like the answer or think that there are two correct or something like that. It makes sense for the first part of the relation where x equals y because <laughs> it's symmetric just means x, 
y, y, x implies x equals y. Yes. Um, but for me, that second part where it says or x equals y plus 4. Yes. I mean, like, 2 isn't equal to 6, right? But they're related. Or yes, they are the same thing. So I guess I'm, I'm just confused as to how it implies that x is equal to y if they're related. Is there two different x is, x is not necessarily equal to y. But so then would it have to when the two elements in R are related, should we write a few values that are related? So who wanna tell me two values that are related according to this relation? Twenty four. <laughs> one and one are in the relation. Fantastic. Some other that are related. One and five. Well, five and one. All right. All right. Should we write a few more so we really understood everything at this point? All right. So, is this a relation symmetric? Why not? Because we just saw that the five and one are related, but one and five are not. So, no symmetric. Is this anti-symmetric? Yes, because if x is related to y and y is related to x, they are the same. Say that again. So it's anti-symmetric. So, so basically it's, it's saying that if they both measure up to that relation, it's but yes, I guess this is the Suppose that you find x and y, yeah. and then suppose also that you find y and x. Can we claim that they are the same or not? Well, that's what confuses me because those are both in the relation, but they're not both anti-symmetric. Right? Five and one. Like, so anti-symmetric would be you have to go through the, the additional analysis of looking at the x and y to see if they are equivalent. So anti-symmetric says, look. If you find uh, 3 and 17, and also 17 and 3, then uh, 17 has to be equal to 3. So here, you never find uh, this one. So it's the Mac McDonald's argument. You didn't eat any hamburger, so you don't have to pay any. So, okay, so just if there is something in the relation that is not anti-symmetric, you can just ignore it? So... You are using a bad word. So, you say something which is not anti symmetric. What is this something? Five and one. So, but if you have five and one, then you don't talk about symmetric or anti symmetric. This is a pair. Symmetric or anti symmetric is the entire. So, since, there's, since there's no one in five in your set, you can get away with saying five and one is anti symmetric because there's no other corresponding. So, you say that R is anti symmetric. Not five in one. Because there's no there's no one in five, so you can't even right. So you have to have two pairs. Two pairs, eh? the one way and swap. If you have the pair and the swap pair, then they have to be equal. And here, if you find one and one, and the swap is one and one, and one is equal to one. So there you are safe. All right. Any more problems? Yes? Uh, 26 real fast. 26 real fast. I like the real fast. So, uh, my, uh, my logic as to I answer P, and the reason I answer P was because basically all of the options have S being some type of finite relation, either a function or just a This was a long and I got lost in the middle. <coughs> so, 
you say that, that because there are because there is nothing inside it is not a relation or it is it's not a so a function and equivalence and a partial order on A are all a binary relation on A. Yes. So, if you remember when we discussed this, uh, when we discussed uh, uh, symmetric, reflexive, and transitive, uh, we picked uh, four relations. Uh, and for these uh, four relations, we discussed uh, whether it was a symmetric, reflexive, transitive, and asymmetric. Did anyone remember this? And so, one of these four was exactly the end. And we said exactly whether it was a reflexive, symmetric, uh, Transitive. So if you remember that one, that was the answer to that. Do you remember that one? Remember no? what? But the, so I remember transitive symmetric anti And so one of the relations that we used to discuss at all was the empty one. But so basically, an empty set of pairs is a set of pairs. All right, so this was briefly enough. Any other example you want to discuss here? Yes? 30. You want to tell me why you want to see 30? I'm not sure why it's not reflexive. If X and Y are both not over 5, and Y and X are both not over 5. So is 1 1 in the relationship? So listen to me, not to him, because I'm answering. Is one one in the relation? And then it's not symmetric. I'm not sure why it's not reflexive. Yes, so sorry, I said symmetric, but it's reflexive. One one is not the bear, so it's not reflexive. Yeah? Good. Alright, I'll move on. Topological sort. You remember what is a poset, right? Yes? You are going to ask me? Over 10. You want to tell me why you want to see 10 so I know what I have to tell you? So, what are the elements of X? Months, right? Like April, June, or whatever is there. What are the elements of Y? Sets of months. So, the intersection is N, because one has months and the other one is set of months. All right. All right, so who wants to recall what is a poset, a partially ordered set? Yes? So, it's a set of elements without any requisite. Any element is fine. And then we have a relation on the elements of the set, which is a partial order, which is an order. And so, as you said, it's a reflexive, Yes. All right. And so here we have an example. You remember the has a diagram of this? At the bottom, we put the minimal element, the element that no one comes before that. Here there is only one. The next line, then we put the element which are bigger than this one, and no one comes in between. So, two, three, and five are bigger than one. 
And you don't find any element which is between 1 and 2, or 1 and 3, and 1 and 5. And then the next level, we put the one which are bigger than the one before, and no one can inside. We call this an immediate successor, and so on. And so if you look at 2 is bigger than 1, why? Because 1 divides 2 in this order. 4 is bigger than 2, and 8 is bigger than 4. Why 10 is not bigger than 4? Because 4 doesn't divide the 10. Here the ordering is a divide. All right. So now I want to write all these elements in a line so that if I write an element before another, in my line, this element comes before the other one in the ordering of the offset. This is called a topological sort. And so, now I'm showing you an algorithm to do this. And so, here, there is a beginning of this the topological sort, which is look good. Why? Because if you pick two elements, like 1 and 5 there, in the line, 1 comes before 5. In the process, 1 is smaller than 5. This one is bad. Why this one is bad? Right, the 5 comes before, sorry, 5 comes before 10, but when I write it here, I write the 10 before 5. Alright? So, if we have a partially ordered set, if we have a partially ordered set, how do we compute this topological sort? We do it in this way. For every element of the partially order set, we compute these two things. Pn is the number of immediate predecessors of n, and this is the set of the immediate successors. So, let's do it uh, at least in part uh, for this one. Here I have... Uh, yes, thank you. Here I have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... Uh, Sorry, is visible? Yes. So now I say Pn, let me flip it back so you read it one more time. Pn is the number of immediate predecessor of n. So you need to look at this one and you write it on your piece of paper. How, how many immediate predecessor one has? Zero. Two? One, three, one, four, immediate predecessor. One. one. Very good. Who has two? Ten. ten. So I have to write more to get to the ten. Eight, nine, ten. This one has two. All right? Oh, six also has two, right? Six also has two, right? So this is the number of immediate predecessors. So S of N is what? Is the set of immediate successors. So what do we put here? Right. Two... 3, 5, and 7. All right, uh, is a set. I write it this way, otherwise it gets too messy. 2, 2 has a 4 and 10. 2, 4, and 6. Sorry, 4, 6, and 10. 3 has a... No, in 6 and 9, yes. 
All right, you got it. Yes? So now we have the algorithm. So, have this on your piece of paper and uh, we have to look at the algorithm to do it. Says, as long as there are elements eh, that you haven't processed yet, eh, output and remove some n such that p of n is zero. So here only one is there, right? So I put the one there and I remove it. Now this is gone. <coughs> I think you want to look at this one. It says a decrement uh, pk for every k in Sn. So now I have to decrement uh, p of n uh, for all these numbers. So, so this one becomes a what? Zero. Zero. Five, five was one, so this one also becomes a zero, and the last one was a seven, this also becomes a zero. You with me? So now says, uh, output uh, sum that uh, P of N is zero. What do we pick here? Let me pick a three. All right, uh, I can pick two, three, five, or seven. Anyone? This one seems a little bit more interesting. Here for nine, I had one. So because I pick a three, what do I do? I cross this out uh, and I eliminate. Uh, and now I decrement the counter of six and nine. So 6 was a 2, now is a 1, 9 is a 1, and now is a 0. All right? And so you keep doing as long as you have elements. You look for one that is 0, you output it. And then you decrement the counter for all the elements that comes after t. Why? Because you took that one up. If you do it until the end, you get uh, this in order. Sounds good? Yes? Is this to display the set that the partial order is on, or the, the set that is the partial order of relations? So, this is uh, to compute the uh, a sequence of arguments uh, that if you execute them, it depends what is the meaning of this. If these are the set of a recipe, you write in this order, if you do the set uh, in the order, the cake comes out right. If you don't, that may not come out right. Like uh, we put the cream before baking the cake and entering the disaster. Let me show you something that may motivate you a little. Let me go here. Oh, you are not here. All right, uh, so this is a game. Eh? So these are things, these are uh, pieces. If you go to Toys R Us, you buy this is, this is plastic pieces that you can uh, move around uh, in this way. You can uh, rotate, you can even flip. You see that I'm flipping it. And so the goal is that uh, you put them uh, in a way that uh, looks like this one. We can try. This is the bottom. And I put uh, this here. Hmm. Put this here.
Well, close enough, right? <laughs> so, if you play with this one, it uh, looks very natural. Here, you can put uh, the pieces on top of one another because there is no way to block uh, this one. So now, if I click uh, on one of these uh, pieces, uh, if I click uh, there, I click on the blue and uh, the red and the yellow that are behind. Right? When you click, the program says, on which uh, piece uh, are you clicking? and finds uh, that is on the blue, on the yellow, and the red. Which one should the program pick and move around? The blue. Why? It's on top. So these uh, pieces uh, are sorted uh, with a topological sort. Why? Because if uh, you pick uh, this yellow here, and this uh, green here, which one comes first? Neither. Right? But if I click here on this blue, do I pick this blue or the red which is under? The blue. And if I click this one, pick the red on top or the blue in the middle or the red under? The red on top. So here, to make this work, you need a topological sort. In fact, the program keeps inside all the pieces that topologically sorted. So when you click on something, knows which one you are moving around. So this is to tell you that if you do something like this one that uh, looks like a game has nothing to do with what we are learning, actually this is making very heavy use of what we are learning. Otherwise uh, the game wouldn't look uh, natural. All right? So. This is just uh, to motivate you to learn uh, this stuff uh, because then when you write a program, you have to use it. All right. So I left uh, something behind, uh, and I have uh, five minutes, uh, and maybe I want to do this. Uh. Compute all the possible chains uh, for a given amount. All right? Should we try to do it? I write uh, this in a program that is called Ruby. So let me tell you how I do it. Suppose uh, that I have to give you 17 cents uh, change. When I start, uh, I don't have any coin. So I have an empty set of coin or bag of coin, right? So what is the cashier doing? That's what I give you, say, a nickel. So now I have to give you 12 cent change, eh? and here there is a nickel, right? Then I give you a penny, so now I have 11, and here I would have eh? a nickel and a penny, right? Then I give you a dime, here I go 0, 1, and here I have a 5, 1, and 10. And so what is the property here? This one plus uh, the value of all the coin uh, there remains a constant. This is called an invariant. Every time you write a loop or a repetition or a recursion or an iteration, unless you have an invariant, you are not going to get it right. All right, then. So now I write a function that uh, keeps this invariant. When this one goes down to zero, the other one is uh, the result that I want. Couldn't be easier, right? So here I pick, I choose a coin because I want all possible changes. I try all possible coins. If I start with 17 and I pick a quarter, what's going to happen? I overshot. 
So if the amount I have to give to the customer is negative, I abandon because that is a bad solution. All right? So let me call this a change RB. So, so first, uh, let me make this a little bit bigger. So D is the denomination 1, 5, 10, and 25. All right? So now I have a change. And to change, I pass two things. One is the amount, and the other one is the coins. All right? Are you with me? What is the meaning? So, if uh, amount uh, is equal zero, what do I do? Print uh, the coins. Yeah? Else if, uh, you know, I forgot the syntax. Else if uh, amount uh, is less than zero, then what do I do? Overshot. I don't do anything. Else, what do I do? So, for each denomination, I forgot the syntax. Now I'm going. What do I do for each denomination? I take it from the amount. Uh, and I put it uh, in the coins. Yeah? Change uh, amount uh, take away x, uh, and uh, here I put it in the coins. Oops. And so now I do what? Uh, Change, as an example, 17 and no coins. So I call the interpreter. Oops. Here it is. So if you look at the first, uh, the first is what? Uh, all 17 pennies. Then I have what? A nickel and a 12 pennies. I'm not going to count, but I'm sure they are 12. The next one is what? One penny. One nickel and 11 pennies. I'm not too happy because it's the same, right? And so all the other ones. So how do you get rid of the repetition? Well, you computed the same set at once. You keep them sort. So first you put all the pennies, then all the nickels, then all the dimes, and then all the quarters. So I have to change the line of the program. Since my time is up, I don't do it. Why did I show you this? Because this is recursive. If you look at the program, this uh, function change eh, causes a change inside. You see it? So try to find a solution that is not recursive. It's going to kill you. <laughs> All right. See you on uh, Wednesday.